Hi guys, Pastor Matt Chandler here. Pray uh, that this sermon, this resource, uh, be used by God in conjunction with you belonging to a local church uh, to grow you and sanctify you in your faith. If these resources bless you, would you consider giving back to us here at TBC? You can do that either through the app or you can go online to TBC Resources uh, and give there. Again, pray that this blesses you and grows you in your love for Jesus Christ. Good morning, my name is Terry Craigle, and my husband Mark and I sing in the choir, and we also serve in our Live Well ministry. And I'm going to be sharing the reading from Galatians 4, 4 through 7 this morning. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Terry. Well, good morning. It's good to see you. If you have your Bibles, I would love for you to open them, whether it's on your device or you've got a hardback. We want to pick up one of the hardback ones in the chairs around you. I, I just want to, uh, I want to follow through these first two verses that we read here and just kind of pull phrases out uh, and talk through them. If, if you've noticed, if you were here last week, doesn't the, don't the last three verses sound nearly identical to where we were in Romans 8 last week? That's because they are. Uh, And so we'll talk about uh, why that's that way here in a moment. But first, I want to introduce you uh, to my nephew, Ben. Uh, And so this is Ben. Uh, There he is. There's Ben right there. Um, Ben is uh, 10 years old now. Uh, Ben and I often talk about the fact that uh, we carry uh, the burden of the men in our family uh, with our dark hair and attractive, handsome natures. And the other men in our family don't have that burden, but Ben and I, we're, we're the most alike in that way. And so uh, my sister and her husband uh, live in Taiwan. Before that, they lived in mainland uh, China uh, doing significant gospel work. And my sister and her husband, uh, who happens to be my college roommate, but I don't have time for that story yet, uh, <laughs> decided they wanted to increase uh, their family. And my sister was like, not with this body. And so they set out to adopt as expats living in Taiwan. We're looking to adopt uh, a a Taiwanese son or daughter. Um, Ben's mom uh, couldn't care for him, so put him up for adoption. He was in a foster care home for a while, then was adopted and, and then returned. And, um, yeah, heartbreaking. And, and then back in a foster house that wasn't going well. And, and when my sister and her husband adopted little Ben and, um, the process to adopt is always complicated when you're an expat in Taiwan, you're trying to walk through a process that's not in your primary language. Uh, everything's harder. Uh, and so it took about two or three years uh, to navigate, had uh, in-home studies where there was a lot of questions because this isn't the, the way we do things. Help us understand why you do things this well uh, or this way. And then uh, when all was said and done, Ben became uh, a coddle, um, which is my sister's married name, and, um, and really became really just a bright, shining light of joy and gladness. So just easily one of my favorite family members. If you can have favorite family members, I know you can't have a favorite kid. I mean, you do, but you can't. And, um, and, and then there, there's Ben who always brings a lot of energy, always brings a lot of life and, and always makes things uh, more fun than they already are. Um, and so last week we talked about adoption 
When we're, if we're looking through these angles of the gospel, right? We're looking at the gospel from all these different angles where we talked about adoption. It's one of my favorite ways to think about the gospel, consider the gospel, meditate on the gospel to be a son and a daughter, of the creator, God of the universe, not a slave, not a, but a son with, with all the rights and privileges of being a child of God. Well, redemption, which is our angle for this week, redemption is the process by which adoption takes place. All right, so where Heather and Rich had to fill out paperwork, they had to do a home study, they had to spend uh, thousands and thousands of dollars, they had to help him kind of integrate into their life, they had to for a while cook their normal Western meal, but they were getting him noodles and chicken and things. To this day, sorry Ben, to this day Ben dislikes Chick Fil A. What? <laughs> what? He loves the Lord, guys. He's in, but. <laughs> God, just barely like smelling like smoke and glory, right? Uh, and so, man, there was just a lot of things that had to be navigated to make him a, a coddle and, and be a part of the coddle family. Well, for you and I to be children of God, redemption has to take place. And so we're going to talk about redemption this morning, and it's why we're just going to concentrate on the first couple verses here, because the last few we looked at last week, but I wanted this passage so you could watch and be connected, right? Uh, and so uh, let, let's dive into this. By the way, um, redemption simply means to purchase back. Redemption at its basic kind of concept is I'm going to buy this back. I'm going to purchase this back. That's what redemption is. And so let's look at the passage, Galatians 4, starting in verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. I'm just going to stop and I don't want anybody to panic. We're going to move through this passage fairly quickly. But one of the reasons I am a huge proponent at reading your Bible slowly and carefully rather than a ton of it fast is so that you might not blow past something as significant as that. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. So, so let's chat about what we're looking at here. That means the universe isn't random. The fullness of time? What? Who can see the fullness of time? Only the one who is outside of time. So in this little sentence, not even a full sentence, there's a comma at the end of it, we see there is a sovereign God, a creator that is outside of time and, and that something is happening on the timeline of history that is beholden to the God of the Bible in the fullness of time. Who knows when the fullness of time is? The one that's outside of time. So that life has meaning and that we're not stuck in a perpetual loop, but a creator God is up to something that has a beginning and will ultimately have an end. You and I are not stuck in Groundhog Day. God Amen. is up to something. Yes. God is up to something in the fullness of time. He sent forth his son, born of a woman under the law. All right, so at the right time, fullness of time, God's up to something from creation to revelation. God is up to something, and when the time was right, he sent forth his son. So this is important. The son of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, triune in nature. The son, co-eternal with the Father, has always been, will always be. We read in the Bible that he is the active agent of creation, that he holds all things together with the word of his mouth, descends and puts on flesh and blood and dwells among us. Sent forth his son to be born of a woman. He's fully human. With all of the temptations that you and I have endured or sat under, He's a human being. He's not a magic man. He's a human being. In all the ways that you and I are human, he is human. Now, he's also fully God, which is something you don't have going for you, but he is 100% man and 100% God. And Paul here is serious about you knowing, hey, listen, he was born of a woman. It's not a ghost. He has a mama. 
and he's under the law. This is a reference to the fact that he's a Jew, that he was dedicated in the temple, that he was circumcised on the eighth day, that he was taught the law, that he's under the law. So, so we have this God who in the fullness of time sends forth his son, born of a woman, under the law. Now we get in, well, that's magic, but we're going to go magic, magic. Now, double magic. Look at what happens. To redeem, purchase back those who were under the law. And then if we kept reading, so that we might receive adoption as sons. So you see that redemption is the process by which adoption occurs. That the way we become children of God is to be redeemed out from under the law. Now, when the Bible uses the phrase, and Paul in particular in his epistles, uses the phrase under the law, it is always in reference to you and I trying to save ourselves. That's what he means by under the law. That, that you and I try to save ourselves and to try to save yourself is to be enslaved and under the law. So what does it mean? What does that look like? I'm so glad you asked. That's the bulk of the sermon. If you wouldn't, didn't want to talk about that, this is going to be real fast today. So let's look at this. Here's what it means to be under the law. To be under the law is to attempt to justify yourself by the law. So to be under the law is to seek to justify, make yourself right, make yourself just before a holy God by using the law. Here's what Galatians says about that. Galatians 2, 21. By the way, Galatians is one of the few letters written by Paul that he is, he is frustrated. Like, go read uh, Paul's epistles. And he's like, grace and peace to you, brother, in the name of Jesus Christ. You know, I long to be with you again. Like, he, this book starts like, who bewitched you, fools? Christ was betrayed. as cru-. Like, he is hot. The Galatian controversy was that Judaizers had come from Jerusalem, and they're telling this young, fragile church that they have to become Jews before they can be Christians. Paul ain't having it. This whole book is aggressive, and I love it. (laughs) Galatians 2.21, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. So this is week one. Do you see how these things are starting to come together? This is justification. So here's what he's saying. I won't nullify the grace of God, the grace that God's affording by believing that I can justify myself through works of the law. So we talked about this. Like, look right at I love you. You are not a Christian because your folks were. Is your daddy upright in love with Jesus in the book? That doesn't mean you are. It means your daddy was. Your mama fear the Lord, prayed you into the kingdom. Like, great, that's her faith. That's not yours. You're not a Christian because your parents were. No one's born a Christian. No one. Now, could you be born in church? Absolutely, right up on the altar. (laughs) Pastor, spank your bottom, dedicated right there. Jesus baptized the whole thing. Doesn't make you a Christian. You're just born in the church. Raised your whole life, doesn't make you a Christian. Doesn't make you a Christian. Behavior? doesn't make you a Christian. Your bloodline doesn't make you a Christian. Your behavior doesn't make you a Christian. And look at me, because this, this, I'm stepping on toes. It's not my fault, though. These toes are giant. <laughs> How well you stack up to others doesn't make you a Christian. But God, isn't that hard? Can we just talk for a second? You know how easy it is to start, start to feel better about myself because I'm not that? Anybody else? I mean, I feel like I, I mean, I, like how easy is it to feel better because you can spot those who are doing worse? How evil is that? Yes. And, and the apostle Paul here, he, he ain't having it. He said, I will not, I do not nullify grace. I'm not going to do it because if I could be righteous on my own, then Jesus died for nothing. There is a way to live that says, I don't need Jesus to die for my sins. I'm doing all right. It's a dangerous way. To be under the law is to attempt to obtain the spirit through obedience to the law. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that God has placed eternity into our hearts. You know what that means? If you grew up in church, that, that's the old, you know, there's a God-shaped hole in the middle of your heart that only God can fill. It's not cliche, it's Ecclesiastes 3.11. That only eternity 
will fill the longing of your heart. It's why everything runs out of steam for you. It's why everything that satisfies or is pleasurable in the moment will eventually fade in its ability to do that. Why? Because you were created to be indwelt by the Spirit of God. You were created for the presence of Jesus. And the way that works now is not by getting on a plane and heading to some temporal or tabernacle somewhere. It's the Holy Spirit in us. Listen, Jesus and his presence are as thick and as real in here as they are in Jerusalem. I've been. You don't have to go there. It's not like you get to Jerusalem, you're like, oh, he's so powerful here. No, no, no. He is everywhere. And where there are believers, he is present because he dwells inside of them. And when you, when you believe that you control the volume on the Holy Spirit, like he's some kind of genie in a bottle by your behavioral modification, you nullify the grace of God and you put yourself under the law. You enslave yourself to the law. To be under the law is to rely on the works of the law. So here's Galatians 3.10. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. So we talked about this one, right? This is week one again. Like one of the primary purposes of the law is to show you you can't and that you need a savior. Remember, were you here for that? Like we just did the 10 commandments and we bombed it as a community. But like bombed it, like zero out of 10. And so he's saying here, you want the law. You want to justify yourself by the law. You have to know all of it and obey all of it. That, that's being enslaved. That, that's not grace. That, that's crushing. That's not freedom. That, that's love based on merit, not love freely given. It's a terrible way to live and to understand the Christian faith. You will be constantly working on self-improvement projects and constantly falling short. Like, gosh, you you already know this. Anybody ever, like, like you had this moment with the Lord and you swore never again only to make it about 48, 72 hours? Anybody got that testimony? So everyone does or you're a liar. All right, so you can be a liar or fess up, but that's true about all of us. I'm gonna do this now. I'm not gonna do, uh, except... According to Romans 8, weak as you are in the flesh, you can't. It's part of the purpose of the law to show you, oh, gosh, I actually need a savior. I'm not as as good at this as I thought I was, right? And then lastly, to be under the law is to seek eternal life by obedience to the law. So this is uh, Galatians 3, 21. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. And so again, here he is making the argument that we're in deep need of redemption to be purchased back from being enslaved to this because there's not a moral code that's going to bring in life. There's intimacy with our creator. There's relationship with Jesus. But there's not a moral code that you could nail that's finally going to give you the gladness that your heart desires. So in each one of these, Paul, super frustrated with the church at Galatia and the Judaizers that are falsely teaching there, is saying, you've bewitched yourselves. You've enslaved yourselves. And now here in this part of the book, he's letting them know, listen, to be children of God, you must be purchased back from this slavery Um, And and then he's going to make the argument that we're not under the law, we're under grace. That doesn't mean that we don't strive towards obedience to the law. That's terrible teaching. It's that when I fail, I can get up and keep moving towards God, that I'm not condemned in my failures and struggles. Then again, these are all starting to come together. Like, didn't we say, even week one, like I was justified in a moment and a train wreck for the next three years, but I loved him. That gum and I loved Jesus, but I had all sorts of lust and violent issues. Anybody else uh, give themselves over to Jesus as just a bit of a train wreck for the first few years? Okay, now hold on. Get your hand up. Look at this. Right? Now, do you think he loves you less or more now? Right? See how this is crazy? Where we start like that, 
I don't hardly know anything, but I love Jesus. And over a period of time, we fumble and bumble and stumble and bust up our knees and create a giant mess. And yet, we're in his love, experiencing that love, walking out that love. It's why when the word of God confronts us, we're so happy to conform to it, maybe even with a struggle because we don't understand. But then we conform ourselves to the pattern that he's revealed. And all of a sudden, man, it's a, like some of you right now, man, you're just like right in the, this moment, like you love Jesus, but your, your life's a bit of a wreck. And, and I don't want you to lose heart. He, he knew what he was buying. Maybe, maybe this way of you, like Jesus got the Carfax. You tracking with me? Like he got it. Like he knew what he was buying. If you don't know what a Carfax is, let me use this as an illustration. Um, my mother-in-law is a realtor. And when you, when you purchase a home, you should ask for what's called a clue report. A, a clue report lets you know everything that's happened in that house. So if there's been flood damage, you know, water heater bust and flood the floor, you, you'll get, it'll be on the clue report. Somebody, somebody died in that back bedroom, that's going to be on the clue report. I don't know about you, I want to know that. I'm not superstitious, but I'm a little stitious. It was just there. You had to take, you had to swing at it, had to swing at it. Sorry, mom. And, and, and this clue report just lets you know that this is, that this is everything that's happened in this house. You need to know that Jesus has the clue report. He sees everything and he's still buying. He's still buying. That's what redemption is. I know. Oh gosh. Yeah. I gave him that blessing and dang it. They blew that up and I want it back. Oh yeah, I let them take that car for, they destroyed it and I want it back. I mean, they decimated the house I gave them and I'm buying it back. Well, man, did you see what they did? Yeah, I mean, you, did you see what they did to the kitchen? Yes. And I'm still paying full price. I want it back. This is redemption. And when redemption moves us in to adoption, Jesus is buying it all. He redeems it all. And here's what I mean by that. When we surrender to the redeeming work of Jesus Christ, he takes all of us past, present, and future and redeems it into his greater story. Let, let me show you this in the life of the guy we're reading, the Apostle Paul, right? He was originally Saul, and we run into Saul back in the book of Acts. Stephen, uh, who's just a lay guy at the church, right? He, he, ain't a, he ain't on staff. Just a lay guy with theological chops. A dude knew his book. Like he just like Genesis all the way up to the death and resurrection of Jesus. Just walks through the Old Testament going, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Y'all killed him. And then they turned and stoned Stephen to death. And when they were murdering Stephen, the Bible says that they took off their outer garments and they laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. And here's what we read in Acts 8, 1 through 3. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. If we had time to go to Acts 9, you would see Saul doing all the more of that. Ravaging, murdering, imprisoning, publicly embarrassing and shaming the church of Jesus Christ. Then look in Acts 11, starting in verse 19. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen, that's Saul's persecution, traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenist, also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Now watch this. This is Acts 13. Now, there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and who? What? 
Saul is worshiping Jesus at a church he accidentally planted by attacking the people of God back in Jerusalem? What? Like Saul sets his face to murder and put to death this very young, very vibrant early church, just a couple of thousand people, and he accidentally spreads the gospel all over the ancient world. And then look what happens next. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Antioch becomes ground zero for the three missionary journeys of Paul that planted almost all of the churches in the ancient world by which we get most of our New Testament, and I would argue, by which you and I are in the room worshiping Jesus in Dallas. And how'd that start? With a murderous, blasphemous God-hater who even in his hatred of God ended up serving his purposes. See how redemption works? Look at me. God doesn't waste anything. Even you on your worst day, I'm guessing isn't this. If so, I really want to meet and know your story. Like, you see, like this brother tried to, to kill everybody. And he grew the church more than anyone in history. This is how redemption works. Saul's story gets incorporated into the story of God. And now with great joy, he can become a trophy of God's grace and surrender to God's calling on his life that's actually born of his own rebellion against that calling. Let me show you that. This is 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 17. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, Though formerly I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly and in unbelief. We're going to come back to that. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. And then he repeats, but he adds to it. But I received mercy. So remember, we already said I received mercy, and he explained why God gave him mercy. This is the second reason God gave him mercy. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of ages, yes. immortal and invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Two things. He received mercy. Look at me. I'm going to plead with you. He received mercy because he acted ignorantly and in unbelief. He received mercy. Look at me. For you. Do you see that you're in view right here? Do you see the love of God aimed right at you all the way back here? God, I mean, I've been doing this a long time. I know some of you, you, you like, you can't fathom that God can redeem what you've done. You are so jammed up with the hurt and pain your addiction caused. You are so jacked up at how your lustfulness destroyed your marriage. You are so beat up and, and blown up because you acted ignorantly and in unbelief. And you think it's over for you. And here's the God of the Bible all the way back here going, no, 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 Saul, you're coming in. So that Dan, in 2022, knows he had not sinned my grace. I don't know if your name's Dan, but I'm just, I don't know. That could be prophetic. It might not be at all. But you see what happened here? You, you for those who would believe, Saul becomes Paul. So you would know 
that you can't out sin the grace of God. Now, let me, let me end with this and make an appeal. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I think it was, was it a couple of weeks ago? Yeah. I'm, so here's how Lauren and I work. Like I'm the message and she's NASB. So if I'm like, you know, our daughter's five, eight, you know, or five, nine, Lauren's like, she's five, eight, and three quarters. Right. So the new American standard is a word by word translation. ESV is kind of phrase by phrase. So that's kind of how we work. So that's why I was dialing it. The message is, yeah, sorry, baby. See, it just happened. Oh my gosh. It happened live for everybody on the internet to see. That's it. Exactly. That happens all the time. So several weeks ago ish, uh, I received an email from a woman in our church. She's been here a while and she was up early praying and she, she, um, she, she felt like she got a vision from the Lord and, and she was so compelled by it that she emailed it to me, which I, I think takes a lot of courage. And so when that happens, when I get something, I take that stuff seriously. That's not some small thing to me. When, when that happens, I want to take it and, and I want to hand it to some people who I, who I know will prayerfully consider with me. And then I want to take it to the book. I want to take it to the Bible. And I want to begin to look through the Bible at different images and different, I'm trying to, try, trying to glean from the word of God what might be present here. Now, Lauren, uh, Lauren is a, um, she is a researcher by nature. There are often days at a time that I lose my wife. If she kind of finds something that interests her, she needs to know how it works all the way back to the beginning. Like she recently bought a book on colors and where colors came from. Uh, and so for weeks, it was like, you know where that blue came from? So back in the, and, and so she, she did a deep dive on this little vision. And one of the things that Lauren found, that there was an image of a gazelle in there. I, I think, I'm not sharing the whole vision, but I'm going to show you a little something of came, what came out of it. There was this image of a gazelle in it. And one of the things Lauren discovered is that when gazelles are in seasons of drought and, and they can't get water or food, they literally shrink their hearts and their livers to stay alive. Isn't that crazy? That they have, the gazelles have the ability because of where they live, that in dry seasons, in seasons where they're not sure they're going to survive it, that they have the capacity to shrink their hearts and livers. We don't have gazelles here in Texas. We have deer and deer pant and seek water. I am not ignorant to the pain that we can experience in a fallen world. And the compulsion to shrink our hearts to survive. Listen, I'm not mad at you. God, some of you are still here today because you shrank your heart. Some of you, 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 that's the way you survived it, the way you got through it, the way you made it to the other side for all the options you had. You, you shrank your heart and you, you maybe made some promises that you wouldn't trust like that or, or that you wouldn't put yourself in that situation again and you shrank your heart. And redemption this morning is being honest about the mystery of God's sovereign reign and the brokenness of a sinful world and the invitation. Look at me. The invitation is for you to throw yourself on the mercy of Jesus and watch water pour on your shrank up shriveled heart so that your whole story might be redeemed. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this. Do you know who works with addicts? former addicts. Do you know who loves on moms and dads who lose a child? Moms and dads who've lost a child. Do you know who works really hard to help marriages restored under the banner of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Those whose marriage exploded and the gospel put it back together. You have not out sinned his cross Your story is not so bleak, not so dark, that redemption can't be yours. And yet, you must choose, like David writes in Psalm 42, to pant for water rather than allow yourself to stay shrunk and angry and unable to trust and not going to let go and not going to give in.
And so the invitation again today, as it's been all these weeks that we've been in this series, is for you to come and receive what God has for you in Jesus Christ. And it's probably different than maybe you think. That, that thing you want to let go of, that, that thing you can't let go of, what if that's the very thing that God's given you to really usher you into all that he has for you in Jesus Christ? He will not waste a tear. He will not waste a loss. He will not waste sorrow or pain. That is not who he is. But you can choose to stay under the law But in the fullness of time, God sent his son, born of a woman, under the law, so that he might redeem those, purchase back those who were under the law, that they might receive adoption as sons and daughters. This is the offer of the gospel. This is what's available to you right now. I want you to do me a favor. Why don't you just bow your heads, close your eyes there where you are. If you're at home, you, just, you can keep staring at the screen or bow your heads and close your eyes there. I, I want to just ask some questions in the hopes that the Holy Spirit will um, maybe pour warm water into those deep parts of your soul. If you're in here today or you're watching online or you're watching this six months from now and you would say, oh man, I don't know that I had language for that before, but I, I have, like the gazelle, I have shrank my heart. I am dry and locked up. I, I have in this drought, in this hurt, in my confusion, in my doubt, I, I have not panted for living water. I have not run to the Lord, but instead I have shrunk my heart to survive. And if, and if you're saying, and the Bible's saying that the Holy Spirit can pour water on that today, I, I want to say yes to that. If that's you in here and you're just like, man, I, I have shrank my heart. Will you just lift your hand there where you are? You don't need to be embarrassed. We're not, yeah, get that thing high like we're not Baptists. Yeah, praise God. Listen, you're not alone. There's so many of you right now. Why don't you put your hands down? You, you are just so many of you. It doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to carry that. I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to sing. We're going to sing about the sun coming in the fullness of time. We're going to say like blood and tears? What? The son of God co-eternal with the father put on a physical body and dwelled among us for what? To redeem us out from under the law so that we might be sons and daughters. I'm gonna pray. We've got men and women in the back. They're members of our prayer team. They're wearing gold lanyards, or maybe there'll be some staff back there with a staff tag on. They are simply going to ask for you that the Holy Spirit would pour water on your soul, spiritual water into the deep parts of your being. And that as you confess, I have shrank my heart and I don't want to do that anymore. They, they want to pray with you. And if for the first time today, you're understanding the gospel rightly and you want to say, I'm saying yes to Jesus. I'm going all in on this one who at the appointed time came to redeem me so that I might be a child of God. And man, we, we would love to pray over you in that, baptize you this morning and celebrate new life in this place. Cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Father, I bless these men and women in the name of Jesus. How good are you? I pray that you would make us, as David wrote in Psalm 42, like, like the deer that pants for water, that, that you would orient our hearts to be hungry again, to be thirsty for your presence. Forgive us where we've shrank our heart, where we've refused to trust, where we haven't been able to uh, remember or think about the fact that you're outside of time. You're up to something, even in this current mess that we're in. 
Even the struggle that we find ourselves in, we haven't been abandoned. You're up to something. Help us not shrink our hearts and our livers to survive it. Let us press into you, receive from you, believe and put faith that we're in your hands. I pray against, even now, the little whispers that are in the minds of people that know they need to be prayed for, that know they need to surrender to you, and yet all these thoughts of, no, just say it, no, just say a little prayer by yourself. I just pray that you'd quiet those whispers and that they might, Father, receive what you have for them today. Holy Spirit, help us. We need you. It's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen.